Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you all for being here for our latest update on COVID-19. As I've said before, we're learning more about this new virus every single day. And our top priority continues to be protecting our people. We've talked before about how most, more than 80%, who get this virus will experience mild to moderate symptoms. But even if you're not worried about yourself, it's important that everyone focus on protecting those at higher risk, especially older Vermonters and those with serious health conditions like heart or lung disease or diabetes. As I said last week, our strategy is to slow this down and prevent as many cases as possible. As you know, I declared a state of emergency and we've implemented a range of mitigation steps to slow the spread of the virus from limiting public gatherings and restricting visitors at long-term care facilities and hospitals to banning state employee tra work travel and extending unemployment benefits to those who uh, have to uh, self-isolate and so much more. It's important for Vermonters to know that additional measures are inevitable, but every action we've taken thus far uh, has been based on science, data, and the guidance of experts. That's why yesterday I ordered the dismissal of all pre-K through 12 schools by the end of the day Tuesday, March 17th. So effective March 18th, all schools should be closed. This decision was made in close consultation with the Department of Health and the Agency of Education. We felt this was necessary in order to keep ahead of the curve in terms of reducing the spread of COVID-19. This is a moment of service for all of us. And I know educators and school support staff all across Vermont will be flexible and do their part to support students and their families. I've also asked the Agency of Education to work with superintendents and local districts to make sure every child continues to receive the services that they need from their schools. This includes a plan so students have work, school work to do when schools are dismissed, as well as to create remote learning plans that prepare us for what could be a longer period of time. They will also develop a plan to get meals to kids who need them and services for children with special needs as well as options that meet the child care needs of the health care workforce and other essential personnel. At this point in time, school closures will last until April 6th. But Vermonters need to know. We may need to extend it for all the reasons we've explained. We have to slow the spread down to bend the curve. I know and I fully appreciate the challenges that closing schools will pose for Vermonters. But based on the best science available, this decision is now necessary to stay ahead of the curve to reduce the spread of COVID-19. And to the, uh, the point of quickly evolving guidance, last night, CDC advised further limiting the size of public gatherings to 50. Based on that recommendation, I'm amending my executive order to limit gatherings to a maximum of 50 or 50% 50 of an establishment's occupancy, whichever is less. Additionally, as a state government, we're working diligently to transition our state employees, work, employees uh, to work remotely. As well, we're implementing measures to limit person-to-person -person transactions at state offices like the DMV. Those measures will be combined with 90-day extensions in license and registration renewal. I want Vermonters to know we're continuously evaluating other mitigation steps and will continue to communicate those as they are put into place. It's important to remember that in times of crisis, we all need to make sacrifices but Vermonters and all Americans have risen to the challenges before, and this time will be no different. We will get through this, and we'll do it together. Now I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Levine to remind us 
of all the details around COVID-19, who is at risk, while bending the curve is so important. And he can also address how we're extending our testing capacity. Dr. Levine. Thank you, Governor. Just three short days ago, we stood before you to say that Vermont was not yet at the point where closing schools was called for to slow the spread of coronavirus. But the governor and I both stressed that the calculus could change and change soon. Based on the certain knowledge that we must take every action, even those that are the most disruptive to the lives of our children and families, we have come to the quick and data-driven conclusion that closing schools while considering the many consequences and working to mitigate them, is the responsible action to take. In the U.S., the virus has been clearly overtaking our efforts at containment. In Vermont, our testing underlines this assessment. When I last spoke with you all on Friday, I noted that the Health Department had recorded two positives out of 140 tests. I noted to you that we would be expecting to have a marked increase in testing and that we took our public health surveillance functions very seriously and would act rapidly informed by data. Since then, in just three days, we have now tested a total of 415 people and are up to 12 positive tests. Cases have been reported and people who live in Bennington, Chittenden, Orange, Washington, and Windsor counties, plus neighboring Massachusetts and New York. At least three out of the four most recent cases seem clearly to be the result of person-to-person -person spread of illness in the community and not travel-related. So even these small numbers indicate that community transitioning is occurring. And that is why implementing these social distancing measures is a powerful public health tool, such as banning large public gatherings, prohibiting visitors to care settings, teleworking, and others. So now, in addition to all the actions we've taken thus far to try to slow the spread of illness over time and flatten that curve of transmission, it's appropriate to close schools. In fact, we are at precisely the time when school closure has been shown to be an effective public health strategy. Closing schools at the end of the day Tuesday is a further step that will help us keep ahead of the curve in terms of preventing and reducing spread of COVID-19. We are painfully aware of the disruptions and social isolation that will result from this. These are extremely difficult times for everyone and they will not soon be over. But all of the actions that Governor Scott is taking, together with what each of us individually can do, will help slow the spread, meaning fewer people who become severely ill, fewer deaths, fewer opportunities to overwhelm the healthcare system. That is our ultimate goal. So please remember, if you are sick, stay home. That's now more important than ever. If you are sick with symptoms of COVID-19, fever, dry cough, difficulty breathing, call your health care provider for instructions. Don't just show up and don't go to the emergency room. We must keep our health care providers safe and keep our health system from being overwhelmed. And there are protocols in place to handle your concerns. And if you are well, and I hope we all remain well, Practice social distancing as we've discussed. We will all thank you. I'd now like to introduce Heather Bushy. Good morning, everyone. Um, yes, Heather Boucher, the Deputy Secretary for Education. I'd like to start by thanking our educators and districts and school administrators throughout the state for their commitment to students and families. Uh, we at the Agency of Education have received numerous calls and questions. We are doing our very best to answer uh, your um, concerns, your issues and questions, and we certainly stand ready to serve. 
Um, we are certainly charting new and unknown territory uh, in our state, but we do have some ideas based on previous emergencies, such as natural disasters like Hurricane Katrina and um, more regionalized H1N1 uh, incidents to help guide us in our approach. So we will be relying on some of this information as we provide assistance to districts in terms of their own uh, plans for continuation of education and services. In addition, I'd like to remind us that Vermont is not alone in statewide school closure. This is, of course, happening across the nation. We are lucky in that we have excellent cross-state collaborative relationships to rely on and will continue to do so uh, throughout uh, the coming days and weeks. At AOE, we are quickly turning operations towards continuity of education and service focus. We're setting up a new structure to address this need. Uh, we have released guidance to the field on child nutrition services and more is forthcoming. And our special education division is working as we speak on guidance for providing students free and appropriate public education under remote learning situations. We also have another division working on continuity of education through curricular shifts, personalized learning plans, and lesson planning assistance. So um, I will again uh, just conclude by saying that we are ready, we are here to help um, our districts as, as much as we can. Um, we're in this together and we want to keep those communication lines open. Um, please uh, send us your questions, concerns um, to your usual teams that you're working with and um, we will have much more information coming out um, in the coming days. Thank you. So at this time, we'll, uh, we'll entertain questions. We do have about uh, 10 media members on the phone, uh, so we're going to alternate and take uh, a question from the floor first. Governor, what's the plan for, for health care workers who have kids in school who are obviously needed at this time in, in the state's hospitals and health care facilities? Any contingency there for taking care of them? Yeah, there's a great concern uh, for that very issue. Uh, it's something that we did contemplate uh, in closing the schools because we know that a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, parents are going to be impacted by this. Uh, so that is a provision that we've talked about. Um, we are putting a plan into place uh, so that we can provide for child care for those uh, uh, first responders and those uh, in the healthcare field that are going to be needed uh, in the coming <coughs> days and weeks. So at this point, we don't have it perfected, uh, but we're working on the plan as we speak. Do you think by Wednesday it will be? I believe uh, by in the next two days. It's my hope that we'll have something in place, yes. Okay, next question, Sean from the Chester Telegraph. Are you on the phone? Hi, I'm Subsidizing child care is available to the qualify with the subsidy being paid directly to a group of providers. But if the illness is closed both the group providers, has any thought been given that how to continue the parents who need to have their children cared for? Yeah, thank you for the question. I believe I have the answer to that, but I'm going to let Secretary Smith answer that and uh, be more succinct. Sean, thank you for the question. Mike Smith, uh, Secretary of Human Services. Um, that when we got the order yesterday at the agency, we formed a uh, internal task force to look at these various issues of subsidies as well as uh, moving forward, how we're going to move forward on this. We met this morning. Uh, we're going to be setting up a 24-7 hotline. Those questions of subsidies will be answered in the, in the near future, as the governor had mentioned. We've, uh, we've got a window here that we have, to, uh, we have to get these answers done by, this uh, two-day window, and those answers will be, uh, will be answered. But the, using the subsidies, um, we're going to try to be as flexible as possible to, to sort of forewarn that, and then we'll make the decision of how those subsidies are going to be used, uh, I would say, within the next 24 to 36 hours. Uh. Yeah, Governor, um, not to play you know, necessarily Monday morning quarterback here, but some people are going to look at this and say, you know, as of Friday, here we are on Monday, just a few days later, um, is there anything that you're looking at now that maybe that this should have been called for earlier on Friday, which would have given schools maybe a couple days over the weekend to figure out closing schools today rather than Wednesday? 
Yeah, no, I think we're right on schedule in, in some respects. We were waiting for different uh, uh, guide, guidance uh, in different, many different ways, uh, certainly uh, from the number of tests uh, that are coming back in. Uh, we were watching that. And uh, we feel uh, to be ahead of the curve, uh, giving this two-day uh, period will give us, uh, give us time uh, to get ahead of the curve. So I, I believe we're right on schedule. Uh, and uh, I can let uh, Dr. Levine add to that. Uh, but, uh, but this is something that we calculated, and this is what we were asking for. As I said, uh, this, is, uh, this is every day uh, we're, we're constantly uh, looking at the data and the science uh, to make sure that we, we base decisions on that uh, mythology, mythology uh, because uh, it's really important uh, that we just don't uh, react too quickly, uh, that we have to, to stay calm, uh, we have to be uh, uh, panic free and uh, and but at the same time uh, take care of uh, what we think is uh, the right uh, opportunity at the right point in time uh, dr. Levine do you want to add to that uh, just just very quickly uh, you want to be on the right point on the curve so to speak and know when your cases are starting to escalate and could become exponentially greater you also uh, want firm evidence for community transmission of the virus uh, as opposed to just travelers coming back from places that have the virus endemic. So it really was all the right uh, criteria were being satisfied. And I think the 48-hour waiting period is really a critical time here that it, a lot more can be accomplished during a weekday than a weekend. So the, this was a public health decision to uh, use the school closure as a, uh, another mitigating strategy. But keep in mind, the reasons that these 48 hours are so critical, some of them are educational, a number of them are public health. We have children who need to be fed, need to have meals. We need that to work seamlessly. We have children, as the governor alluded to, who have disabilities or special needs. Those needs need to be met. And we have a healthcare workforce, as the first question uh, illustrated, that needs to be having the time to plan out how they can continue to engage in that workforce and have their children taken care of at the same time. And just to confirm, you did say 12 cases now? 12 cases, 415 tests total. Okay, next question, Lola from Digger. Maybe on you. I'm going to let uh, Heather uh, take this one, uh, but again, we're going to have to be creative, understanding that we don't have uh, internet access everywhere, uh, but we do have uh, a method uh, we're going to put into place to make sure that uh, schoolwork gets to kids and uh, that we can, uh, we can keep track of it and it's reportable. Uh, Heather? Yes, just to uh, echo what Governor Scott said, um, it will be largely contingent on the communities that we're talking about. Um, in some communities, they could rather seamlessly move to a fully online um, platform with some training um, because uh, uh, internet usage and internet accessibility is, is, um, is uh, reasonable in communities. Many of our communities, however, will likely be focusing on a combined um, uh, online and um, paper, if you will, packet format. Um, we will be uh, providing assistance um, to the districts um, depending on their own unique situations and um, our districts and schools know that uh, they are required to make sure that um, all students have access to the materials and to the instruction that will be taking place. So uh, we're seeing, of course, across the state, schools, numerous businesses are kind of temporarily shutting their doors. Um, who should be, specifically, who should be at work today? Well, obviously, uh, those, uh, you know, you have to take some responsibility yourself. Uh, make sure that you're, you're well, 
uh, that you are not sh showing any signs yourself. Uh, we're asking businesses to, uh, to implement uh, some strategies uh, in order to distance uh, workers. If you can work remotely, uh, you should. Um, there are a number of different, uh, different cases. And, and again, I have to stress, uh, you know, we're, we're here in Vermont. We, we can get creative uh, and we can, we can do this uh, if we just think about it a little bit differently. Uh, think outside the box and how we provide the services that Vermonters need in a safe manner. And uh, I have a lot of confidence in, uh, in uh, the employers across the state uh, to do the right thing and to keep their employees safe. Uh, but, uh, but I would say um, just adhering to some of those questions that we ask of those who are going into uh, previous, uh, going into uh, long-term -term care facilities. Ask yourself those questions uh, and, uh, and then and ask yourself whether you should be going into work or not. Dr. Levine, anything else uh, you'd like That's to perfect. add to that? Wilson from the AP. Yeah, hey, thanks for, uh, I got notes from you that had the desk dialed back in. I was worried I'd miss my opportunity. <clears throat> there are two questions here, um, and I'll ask you both at the same time. Uh, as of yesterday, I don't know what today is the fourth case to report it overnight are, but as of yesterday, half the cases came from out of state, and there's some indication that people are coming from elsewhere, are coming to Vermont to uh, come to their second homes or whatever, and whether the, uh, whether the, whatever we're calling this, whether the quarantine, what do you make of that? I mean, does the, do those out of state cases place an extra burden on what we're doing here? And then the, uh, uh, and then the second question, have any of the patients who have been treated, have any of them recovered yet? So those are my two questions. Um, I'll take the first one uh, first. Obviously, uh, you know, we as a nation are in this together, um, and we're going to get through this together. Uh, to, uh, uh, to, you know, we know we have uh, second homeowners here uh, that might be se seeking some refuge uh, from their own communities, uh, and, uh, and we would ask them uh, to, to self-evaluate and, and ask themselves whether that's a good idea or not. Uh, but uh, once they're here, um, we'll take care of them. Uh, we're not going to turn people away uh, just because they're from another state. Uh, we, uh, we in Vermont uh, are compassionate and uh, we take care of uh, ourselves as well as others. So um, while it's concerning, again, I want to, uh, to stress that those living in other states who have second homes here uh, should uh, rethink their strategy. Uh, but again, once they're here, uh, we'll take care of them. Uh, in terms of whether anyone is recovered, I'm going to let Dr. Levine ask to answer that. I, I do think the first question illustrates the concept of viruses do not respect borders. Uh, so, you know, some of our borders, we have frequent interchange, even if people aren't coming to their second homes, frequent interchange across those borders all the time. Uh, so I think we need to consider northern New England as a community. Um, and anyone is really susceptible within that community. For the second question, um, keep in mind the majority of the cases, except for the first two, are all being reported Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So none of those people, of course, have recovered. They've just become ill and gotten tested. The first two cases, to my awareness at this point in time, are clearly not uh, yet on the pathway to recovery. Hey, David. Uh, Thank you. <coughs> Calculus changed over the weekend. Um, why not make it optional for students to go to school today? Why make it optional for students to go to school today, as opposed to saying only send your kid if you absolutely have to? And the second question is, where are we on that chart time-wise? Yeah. Well, I'll take the the first one. Um, uh, obviously, uh, there are many parents uh, who are, uh, you know, understandably uh, concerned about their children, uh, and that's why I said uh, that it's up to them if they don't feel comfortable sending their kids uh, to school, they should keep them home. We feel it's okay uh, to send them to school uh, for Monday and Tuesday. Uh, we're ahead of the curve on this, and, and this is calculated in our approach, giving at least two days to prepare for this. So it's not as though if we had thought uh, that it was unsafe for them to go to school on Monday morning, we would have said over the weekend, don't come in on Monday. Uh, but we, we, again, are basing this on science and data and we feel that we have two days to prepare for this. 
and that, uh, that by Wednesday, uh, having them home will give us the, the best result. So the community spread that you're seeing happening, you don't suspect would happen in a school setting? Well, again, uh, we think uh, getting ahead of this, we know this is coming. I, I, again, we, I want to stress, uh, the, the worst is yet to, yet to come. Uh, we know it's coming. We just have to slow it down a bit. Uh, and again, our strategy involved looking ahead uh, to seeing when we thought the right time was to do this. And uh, it, uh, it ended up being uh, Tuesday evening. Uh, and uh, shutting down the schools for Wednesday is the right approach from my standpoint. So I have a Yeah, uh, that would be showing the chart. I don't know. I understand, and, and, recycling, and, and we're circling through questions. I'll call your name if we have time at the end. I'm not going to be able to show you exactly uh, yeah, where no, we are no. in that chart. Yeah. Uh, but we believe we are in the early phases of community transmission, so beginning the slope upwards, but certainly not anywhere near here. Time-wise, give or take, when do you start? Like, when does the blue start heading down? Time. Right, we're going to find that out. Okay. That's, uh, all. Colin, That's all I can tell you. Colin, seven days. Yeah, hi, thank you. Um, so, yesterday, um, Secretary French had mentioned that he believes teachers will still be paid because um, they will be required to show up to work. But he has said that support staffers uh, represent a more complex question given the way that they're um, funded essentially. I uh, was wondering if there's been any updates about thinking, any assurances that can be given to these people about whether they'll be paid and there are a lot of concerns about that. Yeah, we have uh, communicated to the uh, districts and superintendents that we expect everyone to be paid. Um, so we'll, uh, I know that there'll be some bumps along the road. Uh, we're not sure how, uh, what everyone is going to be doing in the meantime, but uh, again, it's about creativity. Uh, and finding an approach that will work. We, we are going to need uh, people uh, to provide for uh, the services that, uh, that we uh, have, uh, have uh, said that we're going to provide to the, to the children, the students. Uh, so we're still going to need people in order to do that. But uh, we haven't fully developed the plan. Uh, when that plan comes out, uh, we'll, uh, I'm sure that there'll be many people involved. Uh, but again, we've, uh, we've asked the uh, superintendents to make sure that everyone is paid. of uh, South Korea, they've been dealing with this for a while now, they've tested over hundreds of thousands of people, and it seems like the more they test, the lower the estimated death rate goes down. Uh, the latest number I checked from three days ago was 0.7%. So my question is, um, at what point does the death rate become low enough? And we always got to assume there's more people out there we haven't tested. As you said, the symptoms are not always going to be very significant. Um, at what point do we reevaluate some of these measures, clothing, schools, clothing, gatherings? Um, I'm, I'll let uh, Dr. Levine answer that from my standpoint when there are no deaths occurring, uh, but, uh, but I'll let Dr. Levine answer that if, if it's clear what the question is. Not, not super so the, clear, but... The death rate, the more they test people, the more the death rate percentage drops. Right, because they're, they're finding milder people. cases. Right. Exactly. So in South Korea, where they've tested hundreds of thousands of yeah. people, mm -hmm. it's dropped to close to a half percent. Yeah. So my question is, at what point does it become low enough that you start to reevaluate some of these uh, economic measures, shutting schools, shutting public gatherings? Yeah. yeah. I, I, I personally wouldn't look at it that way, because we're trying to forecast the future right now, not get to a point and then say, did it work or it didn't work. These mitigation strategies do take weeks to months. That's why when we talked earlier about school closure, when it's done too early and for two weeks, it's not been shown to be effective very widely. Whereas when it started a little later and it goes a little longer, it's been shown to be an effective strategy. Just like all the other strategies that you heard about at the first press conference and in the executive order, those take time to play out. So when, you know, when we talk about where we are in the curve and et cetera, we're trying not to let the curve follow the red, and we're trying to implement all of these things sufficiently early that they have time to kick in and allow us to flatten that in that direction. So, you know, a half percent is still five times the rate that people die from the flu. So it's still significant. So I don't think I would, you know, 
cheer about success at any point in time in the next two months because it's really everyone doing all of the strategies that we've outlined that's going to help us succeed. And we want to be able to look back at the end of it and go, wow, look how wonderfully we did. But there's no way we're going to be able to do that as time elapses because over these next several months, the entire country is going to see the coronavirus um, rise in frequency of cases. Patricia from Bennington Banner. Um, yes, I'm wondering specifically, we've been told uh, we're here in southern Vermont, which of course has FDMC as our main healthcare provider. We've been told that when individuals started showing symptoms, uh, the healthcare provider was contacted, the healthcare provider said to um, call and schedule a drive-by testing, which SCMC has instituted, and we were told that this uh, woman who was exhibiting symptoms was told that there were no slots available to test her, so they are, they are still waiting. And we were just told last week, of course, that, that there are as many tests as kids that could possibly be needed, and no one's being turned away, so I'm wondering if you guys have received any indication that people are being turned away, as this would suggest. Um, again, I'm not aware of anyone being turned away uh, when a provider requests a test. Um, but uh, again, Dr. Levine or Secretary Smith might be able to answer that from the testing facility. What you're describing sounds like the testing facility didn't have a slot for the patient to have a sample taken. Uh, because as I said in my earlier comments, our key strategy to getting ourselves to this point in time was to test as much as possible. And we had sufficient test kits to do the testing. So the, the role of the provider who connects with the patient is just to obtain the sample, send it to the state lab, and we will do the testing. So I'm not really sure where the confusion came from the case you're describing because um, we would certainly have run that test over the weekend had we received it. Okay, Tim. Mm -hmm. I, th I think it's also important to note that if anyone is having symptoms uh, that they suspect to be coronavirus, uh, even though they haven't been tested, that's just a confirmation. They should, they should self-isolate. Uh, they should not uh, get in, uh, become in contact with others. Governor, everyone is uh, very concerned that the economy is going to crater about losing their small business, their home, their job. What do you say to those people? Yeah, uh, well, I'm concerned as well uh, about the economy. I mean, this certainly, uh, if it goes on for a prolonged period of time, um, could be devastating uh, to our economy. And, uh, but at the same time, um, if we do this right, uh, and, and we have this period of time over the next uh, month or two, and we can get some control over this, uh, I believe there's a path forward. I also know uh, that we are not alone, uh, not our state, uh, not the nation. It's certainly a world issue. Um, so there'll be strategies involved, uh, and we will, uh, we're working with our federal government as we speak. Uh, I've been on, in contact with Congressman Welch, uh, Senator Leahy. I had calls with them over the weekend, uh, and they are going to do everything they can to provide for some stimulus uh, to help us with this economy, to provide for uh, the local economies across the state. And I would just advocate, if there's a way uh, for you to continue to use the services and products and, and use some of these uh, uh, businesses in the state right now, please do. Uh, take care of them. Uh, they've taken care of us. So um, we'll see, uh, obviously, uh, some, some repercussions uh, from this. Um, but if we do this right and take the steps that uh, we've tried to implement, uh, I believe uh, that we'll shorten this and it won't be as devastating. Okay, Michelle from St. Albans Messenger. Hello, Governor. I was just wondering about, uh, to touch off of the question I was just asked, the economic impact on people who work for businesses that they can't work from home, such as waitresses, people who work in shops, and who are getting sent home because the customers aren't there that they need to serve. So now, instead of working 40 hours a week, maybe I'm getting to Waitress and 
Yeah, I, 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 you were a little bit garbled, but I think I uh, got most of the question uh, for those who are having reduced hours. Uh, obviously, this would uh, uh, come uh, through some federal action. I believe that they're contemplating this as well, and uh, we'll do whatever we can uh, to provide for their relief. Uh, and we'll know more. Uh, this is, again, quickly evolving. It's quickly evolving as a virus. It's quickly evolving as an economic package out of Washington. Uh, and so we'll know more in the next couple of days of, uh, of what this could mean. Uh, but I've received assurances from Senator Leahy yesterday afternoon, as well as from Congressman Welch yesterday afternoon. Uh, they are diligently working on this effort uh, to make sure that we protect uh, Vermonters and, and Americans uh, from what we know could be uh, you know, stressful in the lives of uh, of their their uh, their families, uh, as well as uh, with their the businesses that they uh, they represent. Steve, thanks, uh, Governor Rod. Uh, the uh, president of the administration has been out twice now uh, talking about the public-private partnership uh, between Walmart, Walgreens, etc., and some of the private labs. Uh, or anyway. Um, have you heard anything from them? Uh, are, are you looking at uh, you know driving into uh, a Walmart parking lot and setting up? Yeah, we're working on some other strategies here in Vermont. Uh, obviously, making sure that we have enough uh, testing uh, packages uh, is important to us. In fact, I was on a, a call with the Governor Sununu, uh, with the Vice President on Saturday afternoon, and then uh, was with uh, officials from HHSS on. Uh, on Saturday night, about 10 o'clock, a conference call with Governor Sununu and myself and Governor uh, 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 Commissioner Levine, um, and uh, we discussed uh, testing. Uh, and uh, we believe uh, there is a, a path forward for us. Uh, we're, again, uh, taking a, a Vermont approach, and I believe it's going to work. Um, do you want to comment any further on that, Commissioner Levine, at this point? Or? I could. Okay. Sure. Very, very briefly, because it gets complicated. Um, um, I, would, I would characterize what's going on at the federal level as very well-intentioned and aspirational, and it's a matter of when it will be kicking in and implemented, and we hope during this week we'll hear some more about that. But as the governor said, we are taking a Vermont approach, and it turns out that to be successful in testing across the nation, on this date today, you really need to be very resourceful and work with your academic medical centers uh, to accomplish the goal. Uh, because most health departments can't obtain the quantity of the reagents that are needed to do all of the processes involved in testing. So we have some very promising work we're doing with the University of Vermont College of Medicine and with the University of Vermont Medical Center um, with uh, at the level of actually uh, testing reagents, at the level of uh, the kinds of equipment needed to do the testing, and the personnel. And it's really going to become a very nice collaborative effort that will help us maintain the level of testing we've been doing thus far. All right, we're gonna end one more question, and Galloway Digger. Yeah, hi, thank you so much. My question. What confidence do you have, Governor and Commissioner, that uh, the healthcare system can handle this with a doubling of the number of positives since last Friday? Also, how many test kits are available right now? And uh, how many people have been tested? Um, yeah, I have, um, you know, again, I have confidence in our healthcare system. Obviously, the measures we're taking today are, are an attempt to prevent the surge. I mean, if we get to a point where we're at the uh, at this level here uh, is going to compromise our healthcare system, and that's why we have to take the measures we're taking in order to, to reduce that. And it might prolong it a bit uh, because uh, the the it's inevitable that we'll we'll get this here in Vermont. But if we can reduce the the high number of cases at any one time, uh, then we can prevent that surge into our our healthcare system. So that's our approach. Um, but. If we do it the way we're doing it, uh, I believe that we're, we're fine. Uh, we, we have an update uh, every day on the number of beds uh, available and units uh, available. And uh, so I'm confident 
uh, that we're we're doing our diligent, due diligence uh, to make sure that we're we're ready uh, when this does happen. Uh, but the other uh, testing and number of tests and so forth. So as I said earlier, we've done 415 tests. Add five more from New Hampshire of, of Vermont residents. That's 420. Uh, we have in the 400 range uh, test kits available right now, uh, which will be augmented with the collaborative arrangement I just mentioned before. Um, and, I, I, and again, I want to point out one of the previous questions had to do with uh, getting the person tested in southwestern Vermont. And people need to really understand, you know, Southwestern Vermont Medical Center has been an innovator. Uh, they are the first drive-through site in Vermont. And other medical centers are pivoting off of that. Our federally qualified health centers have considered pivoting off of that. We have some uh, capacity within our Department of pa uh, Public Safety to actually uh, create situations that will be like that as well. So in terms of coping with uh, the load of people who might think they need to be tested and whose physicians believe that that is something that would be advisable, uh, we should be able to meet that need. And as the governor said, we're trying to make sure we don't overtax the resources of our healthcare system. Um, and at some point in time, we may get to that dotted line. We hope we don't get above it. How many cases do you anticipate at the, at the uh, height? Hard to know the severity. That, that would be an How many positives are you prepared for? Yeah, that would literally be an impossible answer to give right now. Um, about 297 beds available today. And keep in mind, uh, not all of the 12 positives are in a hospital ICU. A number of them are in home. Uh, they've been seen by the healthcare system and are well enough to stay at home and weather the storm, so to speak, with their illness. Um, and we anticipate, again, if we use the experience of other countries, that over 80% of Vermonters who contract this illness should not require hospitalization and should have a mild to moderate course. I think that's why it's really important uh, that we focus on the elderly and those with chronic conditions and to prevent them from getting it, prevent the spread. And that's why we focus so heavily on that population uh, so that because we know uh, that they're the ones who may be hospitalized as a result. Thank you all very much. Yeah, thank you all. Thank you to the media for uh, um, your questions. And we have to get the governor to a, a call now. And there is a process for questions. If you need to follow up with us, please do so. Um, thanks for communicating uh, this uh, to, to Vermonters in the way you've done it. It really does help. We appreciate it.